Welcome to our professor podcast. I am Micah Sander. I'm Carter Green. And this is the podcast in the history department of Brooklyn College, where we interview our professors. We want to get to know more about them. We want to know them as people. We want to know them as professors and what their classes are like. And we think this was a great opportunity to do so. On today's episode, we are going to be interviewing Professor Casey Johnson. Professor Casey Johnson is a historian specializing in U.S. constitutional history, congressional history, and diplomatic history. He received his BA and PhD from Harvard, his MA from the University of Chicago. Before coming to CUNY, he taught at Arizona State University and Williams College. He also served as a visiting professor at Harvard University and Fulbright Distinguished Chair in the Humanities at Tel Aviv University. Among his many works, he is the author of All the Way with LBJ, Congress in the Cold War, and a co-editor on the presidential recordings of Lyndon B. Johnson. Now, before we can dive into the interview itself, Micah, you have had quite a lot of experience as a student with Professor Johnson. Do you mind going into a little detail from that perspective of how he is as a professor? Yeah, I mean, one of the first things I'll say is that coming from from high school and like the AP US history curriculum in high school, I thought that I was done with US history. I never really wanted to study it again. I thought I had sort of seen it all and it wasn't as appealing to me as as other histories. And and then I took a class with Professor Johnson and I, I took the US from 1945 to present with him. And it really got me back in into US history, um, which I think was an amazing amazing feat. So, cause what I've heard from a lot of students is, oh, I, you know, I, high school or middle school sort of ruined us history for me. And I, I always say, you know, try taking a class, professor Johnson, he'll, he'll get you to think about things in a different way. I, I, I had that course with him and then that led to me doing an independent study with him as well, which was, which was excellent. Um, he was, a he was a fantastic advisor and very receptive to all of my ideas. And he was asking all the right questions. And he, you know, he didn't uh he didn't hover or anything like that. He he trusted in 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 my abilities and uh was just supportive the the entire way. He was supportive of basically trying to present history in a different way. He's a he's an incredible speaker, an incredible presenter. And I tried to uh take some of what he was doing and integrate that into my project. Say I'm a prospective student. You're a prospective I, student. It stays in. <laughs> I'm going to enroll in some history classes. Mm-hmm. And I'm looking on CUNY first. And I see a class for Professor Johnson. And I sign up for it. What can I expect as a student going into that class? You know, every every course he teaches will be a little different, but fr- from from uh, the experience I had, what my advice would be is take a lot of notes, take a lot of notes, and because uh, he's not always going to you know throw the words up on the up on the board, you know uh, it'll often just be spoken, it'll be conversational, and really the key to me was taking notes in class and doing the readings. It sounds simple, <laughs> but. I referred to those notes when we had our midterm and when we had our final, th- those notes were were everything. Uh, he's extremely receptive to questions and he is happy to 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 even go off on tangents and explore other things. Well, he sounds quite interesting, even as a pre-modernist historian myself. If I had the chance again, I may have signed up for one of his classes. It sounds interesting, but I'm excited to hear from the man himself. So, yes, let's. Let's get right to it. Please, everyone, wherever you're listening, give a big warm welcome to Professor Casey Johnson. Thank you so much for being here today, Professor Johnson, on our first episode of uh, uh, OPP. Our professor podcast and uh that, that hasn't been totally uh it, it's signed been off completely on, but... signed off on <laughs> and uh there, now that it has been put into the air there's no possible way for it to be the result <laughs> very happy to be here it may be the biggest question of the day how did you get into history professor 
So I, I I've probably been on this track since I was like five or six years old. The, I, I, what I have been told is that my first political campaign came when I was two, when my uh, mother was pushing me around in the carriage. Um, the my mother was the the city coordinator for a candidate named Robert Drynan, who was a Catholic priest who ran for Congress on an anti-war platform in the Vietnam War and won it in what was a significant upset. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I grew up kind of in a family that was very politically active. My father taught social studies, and so he'd always have history textbooks around the house. And so, you know, that I would be read them, reading them when I was like in elementary school, and it seemed like a nice thing to do. So, you know, I think that, that the kind of upbringing that I had pushed me into, uh, into the field and, and, you know, gave me a sense of of why understanding the background of American you know, government as a whole is is important and why history is such an interesting um an interesting discipline. I mean my, my father taught junior high social studies for close to 40 years. And so when I was in elementary school, I'd sometimes go in and sit in on his his classes. And he was a very, very good teacher, um, very, very unlike me in that he was an extremely stern disciplinarian and <laughs> something that I am utterly un- incapable of doing. Um, but, you know, I think it gave me an appreciation for, um, you know, for the joys of teaching and also the, the, um, the excitement of it at a pretty young age. So you, you've said already a little bit about, you know, why your particular area of study, but you know, did it change over time? And and was there a particular, particularly important professor or mentor at any stage of your of your education? Yeah, that, it's it's an interesting question. I think it, it has changed some. I mean, so so my work always has been, if you sort of look at everything I've done, fits into a, a kind of an interest in institutional history. So I, you know, my my interest is in the, the the study of U.S. political institutions. But as an undergraduate, um, my focus was more straight political history. And the first really good professor I had was this guy named Alan Brinkley, um, who later went on to to uh, to teach at at Columbia. Um, and he left Harvard when I after my my second year there. So I I had to sort of figure out where I would go from from there. And so my my graduate advisor um, was a man named Kerry Irie, who was who was a, a foundational figure in in the the study of us east asian relations and and so my phd came in diplomatic history even though my work in diplomatic history had a lot of um institutional um institutional approaches my dissertation was on a group of 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 senators and and us foreign policy and then in the last decade or so i've become much more interested in sort of legal history slash public policy slash constitutional um matters so even though the kinds of questions i've been asking um you know in the last decade or so are different Different than than what I was asking at the start, they all in some ways deal with um, you know with with how institutions operate and how we often need to look behind the scenes of how institutions operate to get a fuller understanding of uh, of what the real agenda might be. But yeah, I was really lucky. I mean, as an as an undergraduate, I had you know, Alan and and um, professor named Tom Schwartz, who now teaches at Vanderbilt. And, and because I knew I wanted to be a professor, I would spend a lot of I would pay a lot of attention in class and kind of imitate the uh, uh, you know things that I would do in in class. I mean, before the virus hit, I would always like when I would do a lecture, I would, I would always do a, like a one page um, handout that I'd give to the um, uh, to the class, and that was something that I picked up from Tom Schwartz, who was my my undergraduate advisor. And then in grad school, I, you know, I worked with Akira and also uh, with a professor named Ernest May, who was the first historian for the U.S. Air Force and who moved in and out of government for basically for 40 years and was just this extraordinary resource in understanding how government operated and bringing that aspect of of, of history to life. So you know, I, I was someone who really benefited from very very high quality um instruction and where i you know I, I think i knew i always wanted to be a historian in some some respects you know i see how each of the four of them uh you know tom allen ernest and, and akira have wound up affecting my scholarship and in a lot of ways continuing to affect my uh my scholarship and one of the things i often do in class and micah you know this is i, I try to push counterfactuals and and ask you know how, how we can look at, at history in that way and that was something that ernest did and i found that just to be a fascinating way of looking at at history so you know i'd like to think i'm carrying on their uh their legacies in, in one way or another that really sounds like you are yeah i have to ask because 
Professor Mancia has brought it up in her classes as sort of, uh, you know, there's this there's this sort of good spirited rivalry in the department between the the modernists and the pre-modernists. And Professor Mancia will bring up that you studied medieval history before everything in your field now. And she always brings that up as sort of a, a trump card. Uh, is this true? Can you confirm these allegations? <laughs> so, 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 so when I, when when I was at Harvard, it it was uh they, they had a very very weird structure to the graduate program. Um, they 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 like to think of them uh, of a of a Harvard history degree as a as a generalist degree. They they no longer even maintain the pretense of this uh, of this structure. When you would go for your PhD, you would read in four fields, and so one would be your primary uh, area. So my primary area at that point was was international history. History. And then if you were an Americanist, you were eligible to read in two U.S. fields, one of which had to be colonial, and the second of which um, they described as modern U.S., which, which was anything after 1789, a very flexible definition of what modern is. And then the, the fourth field, because again, the argument was you're, you're getting a general instruction in, in, in history, was that it had to be either medieval or, or ancient. And so the the my knowledge of these areas is very, very, very skim. And, and you, you you have to you have to read 60 or 70 books in the area. So I, I would like in deference to Professor Mansier, I would like to say that I chose medieval because I had an extraordinary passion for this for this area of history. But the real reason I did it was that the professor in the area was a guy named Tom Bisson, was just a really, really nice guy. Um and he was he was fun to study with. And my my chief interest uh, in terms of diplomatic uh, 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 history at that point was U.S. Latin American relations. And so uh, Professor Bisson was willing to to read with me in medieval Spain with some connection to uh, to Latin America. And so, yeah, that that was my my immersion in medieval history. And I I will say that that you know, Professor Mancy, she's such a great teacher, but I'm so intimidated by her kind of scholarship approach because it gave me a sense of just how hard that area is in compared to the kind in comparison to the kind of stuff that um that that I do. I mean, my documents are all online now. They're very easily accessible. I don't need to worry about tracking down any of this this tough material. But yeah, it, it was an it was an interesting experience just because it gave me a sense. Although I, I'm not a fan of of uh, of how they structured that aspect of the program, it gave me a sense of how of the range within history and how historians from a very very different kind of area than I work in um, still you know approach the uh, approach the discipline. But yes, yes. My, so my my tenure as a medievalist was very short lived. <laughs> I believe, uh, yeah, I think it was Professor Stern that I heard talking about. You you think it's hard to find documents online? You know, <laughs> try going to you know try going to an archaeological site. You know, <laughs> so, yes, yes. <laughs> but but on this topic of departures from uh, what you study, um, among all your notable works on Congress, political campaigns, foreign policy, there are two that that seem like somewhat of a departure. You co-authored "Until Proven Innocent: Political Correctness and the Shameful Injustices of the Duke Lacrosse Rape Case." And the the campus rape frenzy, the attack on due process at America's universities, and you've written a number of articles and blogs related to this topic. But why why did the Duke case and other cases like it? Why why did they catch your interest? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So, so with the Duke case, I I was um, I was writing for for a joint historians blog called Cleopatria, which um, was hosted at a site called History News Network, which is still around but is now a very very different site. And I started at Cleopatria, I think, in two thousand three or 2004. And this, this was sort of the high point of the blogs. You know, there's, there's this period in the late nineties and through, through the early two thousands where you had a lot of these, these sort of high profile blogs. And th this was a blog. They were, they were nine or 10 historians who, who wrote for it, so, which was nice because you didn't have to post every day. You know, we would, we would do commentary on contemporary matters within the historical profession. And one of the things that I was interested in was this this phenomenon of groupthink, which is which in some ways has become more powerful uh, in in the last decade. But this sense that that certain kinds of history were 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 sort of being pushed out of the the discipline. Um, and so I would write a lot about that. And the Duke case, my my initial interest in the Duke case, I I was not aware that the the Duke the Duke had a lacrosse team when the thing started. My expertise in in criminal justice matters was you know was basically just what you would get from my, my background in, in history but nothing too too extensive my interest in the case started when this when 
before the, the charges were filed, um, this group of faculty, 88 of them, issued a public statement saying that something happened. I mean, so they were basically trusting the word of the prosecutor, uh, promising to continue their crusade after, despite what the police said. And this just struck me as, as so incredibly wrong that, you know, to me, one of the purposes of of the academy is that we as an as an entity are supposed to stand for due process and are supposed to be willing to stand up to the passions of the mob because you know if you have tenure you know, most part that you, you can't be fired absent uh, absent misconduct and so it gives you a special ability to to resist these pressures and here you had the these faculty were just going after their students. I couldn't imagine doing that to a to a student of mine. So I started blogging about the the, the case, and then the 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 editor of Cleopatra said, "This isn't really history enough. You need to start your own blog." So I wound up starting my own blog, which I assumed would last four or five weeks because, after all, the case wasn't all that interesting. <laughs> wound up the the blog wound up being open for eight um, for eight years and for eighteen months, very very, very you know, heavily. And so that then got me. The book contract. I got hired by ABC as a um, as a consultant for uh, six months or so, and you know the case wound up being very very high profile. It, it was a fascinating issue to uh, uh, to write on. Ultimately, the guys were exonerated, and the uh, by an investigation headed by the the current governor of North Carolina, Roy Cooper, a Democrat, um, and the prosecutor in the case was um, was disbarred. Although there was no discipline um, to any of the uh, of the Duke faculty members. So I assumed once that episode was done, um, that my involvement in in sort of campus uh, sexual assault uh, matters was also going to be done. And then it turned out that in 2011, the Obama administration changed uh, federal policy in terms of how they interpreted Title IX, which is this law that bans gender discrimination on campus, which is best known for ensuring uh, women's equality in sports. And the the underlying premise of the policy change was that colleges and universities were so aggressively sweeping this issue under the rug that it required the federal government to basically come in and tell schools you have to put a thumb on the scale in favor of students who file complaints. And I had um, to borrow an in 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 vogue phrase the the lived experience of of, of basically being immersed on this camp this one campus Duke for eighteen months where where the faculty and to a considerable extent the administration were just desperate for these guys to be guilty. Um, <laughs> they weren't sweeping anything under the 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 rug because they saw the 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 guy's guilt as a way to advance uh, their own campus uh, their own particular campus agendas. And so it just seemed to me that the Obama policy was was wrong. And I, I started to notice that students who were accused of sexual assault began filing lawsuits against their against their schools. It's very, very difficult for understandable reasons to 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 win a lawsuit against a school, because generally federal judges in particular do not want to be in the business of determining whether or not if I give a student an A minus and they think they should get an A, that it's a due process violation that they didn't get an A. Federal judges have other things on, on their mind. But the uh, the students started winning these these cases. And so I assumed, all right, this is, this is an interesting area. I, I cover it kind of in Duke. I assume that it will get lots of coverage in the media because it's so unusual that you see students winning these cases. But it didn't get any coverage. So I figured, well, maybe I'll start writing about that and maybe it will wind up getting coverage. And that wound up being the, you know, the sort of the core of the book that I did, the, the, the second book with, with Stuart, but also the core of a lot of the current work that I'm doing, which is mostly law review articles that analyze these, these cases, in part because the cases are coming from everywhere and in part because I got involved very early. This this is an area of the law that I've come law and public policy that I've come to know pretty pretty well. So yeah, my involvement wound up being almost entirely accidental. And you know, if if when the the Obama changes had come and there had been greater interest from someone who hadn't um, you know been involved with this, or if I hadn't been involved in the Duke case, I'm sure I wouldn't have even noticed this this issue at all. But as with the Duke case, I mean, I think there's a similarity in that you know you you see campuses basically because they're worried about bad publicity, uh, denying students fair fair treatment. And of course, if students are guilty, they they should be expelled. But you can't determine culpability or not until you do a process where students have the ability to present evidence and to challenge the the version of events that colleges have 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 offered. So that's been my focus in in you know in terms of scholarship in the last in the last few years. And one of the nice things about teaching here is that, you know, I get a pretty broad range of, you know, of sort of course coverage areas. So I'm basically, you know, 
as both of you know, the political history person, the diplomatic history person, and the constitutional history person. So it's related to the kinds of things that I'm also that I'm also teaching, and it, you know, it sort of brought me into the realm of the federal courts in a way that you know, if you had told me this, you know, when I started the job here, I would have I would have chuckled because it would have it, that was not the area of my focus. That I, I'd like to sort of bring it back then to to your teaching. Because you say that you you know you get you have your you have your niche here you know you have the you're the political history guy or the diplomatic history guy you know do you have a different approach to teaching these different courses how, what's your your sort of philosophy when it comes to teaching the, this material and and how do you present it and how do you engage students yeah it's it's it's, it's sort of an interesting thing it's, I I came here when I came I replaced three professors so that there there was a time when the history department at Brooklyn was evidently much much larger you know it was like 40 40 faculty so they had someone who did us who just did us constitutional history and they had someone who just did us foreign relations and then they had someone to do it who did kind of a 20th century political history and all three of them retired within a year or two before i was was hired at a time when the department you know it, it was frankly when it was 40 or so it was too large and so they needed to consolidate them so the the position that i applied for it was advertised as basically you're replacing these three faculty you'll be expected to provide to provide coverage of in all three areas which was fine with me i had never taught constitutional history before i came here from williams college so there i taught a whole range of courses in foreign relations and in us political history but but nothing legal although if i had stayed there i was in the process of developing a constitutional history class so you know i said i said fine and it turned out that I think the three areas really they they're they're different kinds of areas to teach, which is a, which is great for me because it sort of keeps me fresh all of the time. You know, the the constitutional history class is which I'm I'm teaching this semester. It's it's very heavily a case law class. So we do you know we do lots with Supreme Court opinions. Probably sixty or sixty five percent of the documents um, that we read in the course are are Supreme Court opinions. And all of my courses, you know, I deal a lot with documents because that's that's the kind of history that I that I do. But it's a different sort of document. And the other nice thing about the constitutional history class, you know, at the beginning of my career, my basic area of specialty was a congressional historian. And so I'm able to bring Congress in more in the constitutional history class because, you know, it's 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 a nature of understanding how the Constitution has operated over over time. It's a very broad course. It covers 250 years of of material. The foreign relations courses, so I teach a general foreign relations course and then a a, a regional specialized one. When I started here, I taught the, my regional course was Latin America, but it was clear there's much more student interest. And I spent a year um, in Israel. And uh, when I was there, I developed this U.S. Middle East class. So now my, my regional one is U.S. Middle East class. And I think both of those are much more international in focus. So we cover U.S., but also uh, the, the kind of broader material. And then the 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 recent U.S. class that, that I do that's a course that that has evolved substantially from when I started. I used to kind of teach it as a mini, almost a mini survey class. And now I teach it basically as a straight political history class. I do a lot with campaigns and elections in that uh, in that class. I do a lot more video in that class than than in any of my other courses, in part because you know, the nature of, of politics is, you know, is, is, is that video matters. You know, we, we come up right to the present day. So, you know, we get more social media and, the, and this and this kind of thing. So it's it's a nice rotation for me because I'm, it's not like you're teaching the exact same thing every semester um, or even necessarily necessarily the same the same approach and then one of the the really i think fun things about teaching at a place like brooklyn is that we also have this this good masters program where most of most of our students are our public school teachers um and you know I, both of my parents were public school teachers and so it's a it's a nice way of you know help you, know, you get to help out teachers but also you sort of indirectly bring your material into the classroom because what what the students get from the from those courses you know they're going to use in the classrooms and those courses are completely different than the undergraduate ones and that i i teach those entirely as reading courses i teach them the same way i do my phd classes where we read basically one book a week and then you know we talk about the uh the book in both historiographical and content terms so yeah i th i think it's a it's 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 a it's a nice institution to teach at in that respect because you get to do a range of different kinds of teaching 
Um, and because we're not an enormous department, it's not like you have to t teach the same topic every semester. You mentioned your time in Israel, and you were a, a Fulbright Distinguished Chair at Tel Aviv University. I was just wondering, you know, how your time there influenced you professionally, inf influenced you personally? Has it impacted your your teaching, your teaching in a different country? Because I know you, you've taught at a number of universities, but going outside the U.S. Yeah, that that was a really interesting and, and tremendously enjoyable experience. So I had I had been over to Israel a couple of times before then on various academic missions. I had I had spoken out. There had there had been several issues at, at CUNY and and outside of CUNY about I think problematic uh, campus conduct regarding Israel related matters. And so you know I was invited over um, and decided I, I liked it. You know these these were all these were both short trips of a couple of weeks. I figured well I'll, I'll apply for, for a Fulbright, and I, I lucked out in that. They, they had a four or five year window where they had this distinguished chair in the humanities uh, uh, position as part of the U.S. Israel Fulbright program. And unfortunately, the federal government doesn't fund that anymore as part of their general underfunding of the um, of the Fulbright program. Th this coincides. So the year that I was there coincided with the 2008 primary between Obama and Clinton. There was tremendous interest for that in Israel. And so part of the what they asked of me to do was to do both research and commentary on political matters so the the Fulbright program sponsored me uh, a series of of lectures about the campaign that I gave in a variety of places in in Israel Tel Aviv University asked me to do a research project that would be somehow related to to my area and it turned out that I was there during the the 40th anniversary of the 67 war so I did up an edited volume of, of LBJ transcriptions relating to policy uh relating to Israel related policy which which the Tel Aviv University then published through one of their through one of their programs and so that that was fun I I got to sort of share those that audio material, much of which until until that time had never been heard with Israeli audiences, and then in terms of of teaching, the 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 program asked me to teach two courses when I was over there, but it, it was a lot of fun. So I wound up teaching five, and to to differing audiences. So they had me teach. They have a program at Tel Aviv University for foreign students who want to study in Israel, and I taught there twice. They asked for a U.S. Middle East class, so for the the US Middle East class that I teach here originates from that trip absent that trip I wouldn't I wouldn't have, have done it it went, it went well and then I did a course in in sort of modern american politics for the graduate program uh over there and then they Tel Aviv University is it's a very very good school it's a school that that is particularly important in training future generations of uh, of Israeli leaders. So they had me do a couple of foreign relations classes with a goal of, of attracting students who would then go on to serve in the Israeli diplomatic corps. And it's been fun for me following some of these students as they pop up in various consulates and embassies over the the years. Um, so it was it was a very, very interesting experience. I got to travel pretty widely around around Israel. I got involved in a U.S. embassy program that uh, trained Israeli high school teachers of of English and did that for a few years after the, the Fulbright experience, where we would basically it was a group of three professors, one doing literature, I was doing history and a third doing kind of grammar related studies. And we would prepare content modules that Israeli teachers of high school English would then bring into their classrooms. So I would chuckle about how you know, these Israeli high school students would be getting to hear Lyndon Johnson or JFK because all of my units were basically presidential recording uh, uh, systems. But it was a wonderful experience. I lived in Tel Aviv when I was when I was there. Tel Aviv it's a great city to live in. It was interesting to hear you talking about you know the style that you adopted from the professors you had in school because I, I was very impressed with your style when I took a course with you. I've seen it firsthand, but, but others have said the same thing. You have this incredible memory and you are extremely articulate when it comes to these very complex political subjects. You can speak for long periods with with energy and without notes. You were a, a track announcer at Scarborough Downs horse racing track for five years. Would Would you attribute any of these skills to your time there in Maine? In a way, I think yes. It, it, it was a wonderful job. You know, Scarborough was a harness track. You know, my job in part was to call the races. I would call for four years, eighty-seven races a week. It was a twenty-week meet. 
have to commit the field to memory. You're delivering your call extemporaneously. You, you know, you can't sort of plan a call because the race will will develop in, in different ways. While I was there, I would I ran a, a, a handicapping seminar. So I'd have a driver come up every week and there'd be an audience of 70 or 80 people. And we'd go through the card and 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 talk about this. And and I think it in a couple of ways it, it actually it did. It's first of all, it, it gave me a degree of comfort in terms of speaking before decent sized audiences, which I had never had. But secondly, it was it was a reminder, and this is one thing I always tell my graduate students too, is that you know when when you're giving a lecture or, or when you're speaking in public, period, you, you're not reading. You know, there's a difference between the oral and the and and the written word, and you have to deliver class content in a conversational style. I mean, that's how a harness call always always went as well. You you, know, you want to you want to engage the audience to kind of bring them to bring them in. You know, I, I think it. The effort probably did also help sharpen my memory and and create a system where where it was effective in terms of recall. And so, you know, like if there would be a, a track record or something, you'd have to instantly remember what the track record previously was and be able to to call that as as well. Harness racing is it's it's an industry that's now very very much in decline, but it was a it was a great experience when I was there. You know, it, it, helped, it helped pay pay my way through college, which was nice in that respect as as well. Um, but you know, it it was very very different in some ways than you know than, than anything I'd done. So it's a quite insular and isolated community. But in a lot of other ways, it was it was not. And when I was at Williams, I, I called races at the the Vermont State Fair, which was right near Williams. And I I missed calling because it was it was an enjoyable job. And I I was and remain a fan of the sport. So I was basically getting paid to watch races, which was also pretty nice. Almost, almost the dream. You were living the dream a bit. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Do you have any uh, anything we can look forward to in the near future? Any uh, projects you're working on? Any classes you uh, are currently planning out for the near future? So I'm I'm currently doing two separate uh, law review articles on on Title IX related issues. So the, the first is looking at a at a, a, a somewhat narrow type of cases um, called summary judgment cases, which is basically when both sides have to present their evidence and the the courts determine whether or not there's sufficient evidence to move towards uh, towards a trial. And it's analyzing a very recent development in in case law where accused students who are making a claim of gender discrimination that is that they are saying that schools are discriminating against them on the basis of gender are surviving summary judgment. Till 2019, there were none uh, of these decisions. Uh, and in the last three years, there have been 15 of them. And so the article is going to be looking at this, this case law. And these law review articles are, are it's, it's an interesting process for me because they're much longer than academic journal articles. Um, you know, they they wind up running sixty or seventy pages uh, uh, long. So uh, I'm doing that, and the second is an updating of a of a law review article I did in 2019, which uh, which anal just did a broad analysis of the case law up until that point, and this will continue that from 2020 through 2023. That is my current uh, sort of research focus. In terms of teaching, you know, the, the I when when I was at at Williams, I did a course in the history of Congress, and that's a course that doesn't quite fit into our um, curriculum because it's a it's a little too narrow. I mean, my you know all of my courses tend to be very broad, either thematically or or chronologically. But at some point, uh, you know, maybe I'll do it as a um, as a colloquium. I would like to kind of go back to that as as a topic. It's it's a it's a particular question that is taught very very rarely. In history departments, um, for the most part, it's taught only in in poli sci departments. But with poli sci, you get you know it's, it, it tends to be very data driven and not, and I think actually not terribly interesting. And with history, you can, you can kind of go back in time. So at some point, I'll probably do that that course at least once um, once once again. But you know, as a general matter, my my approach always to to sort of courses is that I try to sort of recycle at least like a third of the material. Um, so you always have kind of fresh material coming in. And as both of you know, I mean, my courses, all of my courses always go right up to the present day, because you know, I think it's important for historians to engage with both the present and the uh, and the past. And so one of the challenges that I always face as, um, as a faculty member is, as you include the new material, uh, the length of the course, the length of the semester doesn't expand. So you have to find ways to 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 reevaluate the older material and sort of move things around. A, a few years ago, when when there was the the various Trump related challenges to, to the Obama health care law, 
you know, I, I kind of refocused my U.S. since 1945 class to do more emphasis on healthcare, law, and policy as we kind of moved move forward because it was very much in the news and it struck me as the sort of thing that students they're hearing about it. It would be nice for them to kind of get a sense of what the of what the background is. So that's sort of the approach that I take with with courses as as a whole, and this is something. You know, again, to sort of circle back to an earlier theme that I got from Ernest. So Ernest May, this was one of his arguments was that historians must engage with the with the present and that we must teach the present. Um, that you know, of course, if you're Professor Mancy, you can't teach the present. But for, you know, for those of us who do U.S. Uh, history, we can't simply say that history stops in 1960 or 1970 and everything after that is political science or current events or that sort of thing. A because we lose students that way because students want to study more more recent material. Secondly, because there are always ways in which you can teach relatively recent recent stuff. So, you know, to take constitutional history, the constitutional history class as an example, the bulk of the sources for this are Supreme Court opinions. The Supreme Court is issuing opinions every year, so there's no reason why you can't teach a course like that that will come come up right, you know, literally to the um to the present to the present day. And so, finding ways to engage with the present. And to ensure that that the courses that I offer wind up, you know, providing some perspective on the present is, you know, is is, is kind of what I'm always trying to do. We're going to put you in the hot seat here, Carter. Uh, would you like to handle these? Oh, I would love to. The rules are simple. I have five questions here. As quickly as you can, give the first answer that your brain gives. Do you have a favorite book? It's actually one of Ernest May's books. This, this book called <laughs> Strange Victory, which 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 reinterprets the the German conquest of France, and it's it's a reminder that historians can write about topics that everyone thinks they know about and still provide a fresh fresh feel. Do you have favorite food? I, I'm quite partial to Thai food, and I live in Maine. We have a not insignificant Southeast Asian refugee community here, and so there's a lot of good Thai restaurants up here. Do you have a favorite activity outside of work? I, I still watch horse racing a lot, and so the, you know, we, uh, the, there's a cable uh, station that, that broadcasts racing, so yeah, if, if I have a hobby, it's probably that. Do you have a favorite activity or thing to do in New York City? Since I, I live in Maine, I, I, I caretaker for my father. My, my activities in New York City consist of Flying into Laquart here at JFK, going on the subway and going at the college. So with those as my three options, being <laughs> at the college is definitely my favorite activity in New York City. <laughs> and the final quick one is, uh, what's your favorite type of music, favorite genre? Uh, classical. I, I have no more questions. That, that, that sounds perfect. Yeah, thank you uh, so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor Johnson. This was this was wonderful. We're really, uh, really grateful that you agreed to do this. No, my, my, my pleasure. It's, uh, I'm glad that you asked me. Our Professor Podcast was recorded with the permission of the Brooklyn College History Department and our student interviewees. We would like to thank both the students and faculty for their contributions. 